we want to be exposed to this consumer growth in this part of the world where we aren't yet and we're going to take a, 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 a risky leap of faith that we're going to be able to survive in the regulatory environment and that our shareholders are not going to um, you know, be very concerned that we're changing our business model. They said we want to be a part of this growth. The minute those big multinationals or when, when GM started investing in, in, in auto plants in Russia or when, when, when Lennar and some of the big home builders started investing in Brazil and, and investing in essentially building homes for the new middle class coming up in the rest of the world. Yeah, I mean, this yeah. is this is the exciting part about our industry right now, which is where, you know, you, this is, I think our conversation to tie a thread around where we've been talking for the last few minutes is we've seen this before at other times uh, in investment history. And we've seen it in, in other places where you had a consumption trend that was very exciting and big sophisticated players came into a small pool. And right now it's still kind of a small pool, not only because of the size of the investments in the companies, but it's made smaller because the regulatory environment is very restrictive yes. and it keeps people out and it's kept out a lot of these big players, but they're, they're coming, they're gonna be here. Someone's opinion may contradict yours. Where's my friend Alan? It's all about your perspective. Who are we and what is the nature of this reality? Hey everyone, welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We are on site at the beautiful New West Summit, the Cannabis Tech Conference. We are now going to be talking with Timothy Seymour. Hey, Alan. How are you? Good to be here. Hi, Tim. Thanks so Pleasure. much for coming on. What an event, huh? What an event. Yeah, and what a panel. You were just moderating as it well. Was, it was exciting. It's, it, it couldn't be, it probably always felt like this, but it couldn't be a more interesting time to be talking about investing when you've completely done a 180 in terms of sentiment on, hey, let me throw every dollar I have into this high growth area when, in fact, a lot of money's not been returned and won't ever come back. So interesting times to Whoa. be an investor because yeah. I think it's it's uh, the the reason for us all to be here has never been more exciting and there is execution and there are companies doing great things and there's also a lot of companies that just have not executed took a lot of money yeah. in um, and will never fulfill the promise. Wow. And to yeah. Me that's, sorry about that. It was a very sober <laughs> start to the day. It's a sober start. To the, yeah. <laughs> and it actually kind of also reminds me of like. Uh, 10 years ago with the decentralization movement as well in cryptocurrencies because yep. yep. we want to leverage the technology of, of decentralization and we want to leverage the technology of cannabis right. for ascension. Right. And if we're using it to try and just make the quick buck along the way, it's it's so let's jump into this. Um, Tim's background so interesting. Um, founder and chief investment officer of Seymour Assets M Management. Um, and you've been just 22 years of investment experience portfolio manager. I mean, let's talk about dating myself. <laughs> it's okay. You got you There's got some experience. good things that come with age. Yeah, it's, it's the experience. Yeah. It's the wisdom. So let's jump into your big picture uh, understanding of what is going on. You started taking us down this path. Um, yeah, what are you currently seeing happening? So, um, and I'll frame it within my lens and my lane as an investor, and. Uh, uh, when I show up at a great event like this and I talk to investors that are also either new to the asset class, I try to point out that um, as, as you referenced either with crypto or you know, maybe it was in the late 90s with dot com, but my, my background is in emerging markets, so new asset classes if you will. And it's a case where um, some of the dynamics in terms of the size of the market, the lack of liquidity, newer companies, corporate governance risks. Um, all balanced against this wonderful, exciting growth story for this, you know, not just post-prohibition, blah, 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 that everybody can talk about, but really, truly a consumption story that is going to be staggering. And, and people tend to throw darts a little bit about the size of the addressable market, but what we all know, um, when you add in uh, adult, medical, wellness, lifestyle, crossover, ancillary, all the different elements of support. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of people in this country that are going to be working in this industry in some capacity. And that's so exciting because yeah. um, it, it, look, for those of us that have been part of the early stages here, there is a small sense of, of not only is this a very viable, interesting, exciting area, but there is a level of social responsibility. There is a level yeah. of, of, I think, you know, not just trying to make the buck at all costs. And, and that's not every company and every investor and every leader, but there's a lot of that here. And that's great. But, but, 
but it wouldn't be happening if there wasn't a huge opportunity for, for the addressable market across multiple demographic groups, across multiple geographies, across multiple product classes. So for me, I come about this as a guy that's used to investing in new asset classes. Uh, I lived in Russia, I invested in, in emerging markets and in Brazil and in China in the earlier days before a lot of people were investing in those markets. So a lot of the a lot of my instincts for investing in those markets are the ones that actually work pretty well here. Wow. So you actually had background of seeing emerging markets in BRIC, the Brazil, yep. Russia. Yeah, and listen Eastern to you. Right? So yeah, you had that great time with seeing emerging markets build up in BRIC countries and also be able to again, just see the vision of what was going on from kind of like a big top-down macro perspective and, and see what failed, what succeeded. Right. Um, and so now I want to see then um, what were maybe some of those similarities and what was happening in the past couple of decades with emerging markets and also with what, like we talked about, there's this, in, there's this spiritual uh, 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 dependent, like we have to be, uh, we have to have a deep ethic. So there's got to be some accountability. There's got to be accountability socially. There's got to be accountability yeah. regulatory wise and, and compliance wise. I mean, there's, there certainly needs to be adherence to uh, a very strict set of rules. And and the cannabis industry, uh, for the most part, uh, companies that have grown up in this industry have have their DNA is to be more compliant, right? I mean, people embrace are embracing the regulatory environment. Obviously, there's certain of the parts of the regulatory framework we want uh, to, 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 to change and you know, to, to, to lighten up on, and they include some of the banking dynamics, some of the, the capital markets dynamics, some of the, the interstate shipping yeah. dynamics. But, but like, at the end of the day, these are companies that, that I think um, are probably embracing it, but that the people that are investing in this industry, so getting back to kind of we're all part of something, um, I think you know. I think there's some recognition that there's adherence to a set of values that are important, and 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 I'm not just saying this. I mean, I've been. I go to a lot of conferences, and I meet a lot of investors, and, and it's not shouldn't be a terrible surprise, but that, you know, in in look in San Francisco, this is this is a this is a heartbeat part of the industry, and and there's a lot of focus on doing the right thing and giving something back while you're taking something from it, and yeah, and social yeah. justice, and and and. And, and criminal justice, and environmental, environmental yeah. for sure, all of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, you know, that's that's nice. Um, but if it didn't, if it doesn't make sense from an economic perspective, and it doesn't make sense from from really a pathway to growth, it's it's not going to work anyway. So that they have to be combined. Yes. Yes. It's also, um, as you kind of walk us through this, again, this like macro perspective, especially on like a, an emerging market of cannabis, there's a whole bunch of regulatory stuff. I mean, with crypto, we also saw a whole bunch of changes now mm -hmm. in regulatory stuff that are going to be happening. But it's, it's like a little bit different with just like, in a sense, like if you're just upgrading like from a, 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 like gasoline combustion engines to electric engines, you don't really need regulatory things. A little bit on maybe incentives of sorts to transition right. people, right. but this is completely different. We're talking, like you said, shipping across countries. We're talking certain, lots of countries still illegal in those countries. Right. Um, so yeah, so let's talk about how, like yeah, wh where will regulatory things have to change in order to maximize, and you were talking about there will be so many jobs that emerge from people sure. getting work here and holding accountability. So yeah, so let's take us down like the regulatory area. Well, the regulatory area is one that, first of all, needs to, to adjust to make companies have the ability to succeed. So that means adjusting the regulatory framework as it exists around accounting. So how companies mm. actually record their business for taxation purposes. So uh, you know, Section 280E is a part of the tax code that basically still counts cannabis producers in the same way as if some folks that are creating and producing illicit drugs and things that are, uh, I think, significantly uh, just fundamentally different. But, but what that also means, or people that are involved in federally illegal industries, it could be running guns, it could be anything. And so the tax law says anybody who's involved in a schedule one something um, cannot subtract cost of goods sold and have traditional accounting metrics that allow them to actually be profitable effectively. So, so there's a case where just some of the regulatories need to, need to make it possible for companies that have a great retail footprint and are trying to you know, operate in sometimes what's a relatively low margin environment have the ability to succeed. There's the whole banking dynamic. One of the things we're seeing in the capital markets today and a big part of our investor panel today was, was how 
it's, it's a painful, painful bear market right now in, in the public markets for the publicly traded stuff. A lot of it's Canadian. Some of them are, are a lot of them are U.S., frankly. Um, is because Israeli now also? Some of the Israelis as well. Yeah. I mean, there's a couple Australians. Uh, but, but the ability to raise capital in some of the deepest, most sophisticated capital markets and pools of capital in the world, which is the United States of America, um, this isn't just me waving a flag. This is just a fact. So these are companies that cannot do that in a traditional way. They're very smart, very risk uh, aware investors that are sophisticated, that want to invest in the sector, understand that it's not you know, a straight pathway to, yeah. to the pot of gold, but understand, the, but they, they can't invest in it because of the federal dynamics. So what that's doing is it's keeping big pools of capital out of this market. And it means that after an initial burst of enthusiasm and excitement by high net worth and prep, private banks and non-traditional uh, institutions, which raised a lot of money for the industry, those folks are tapped out. There's no new capital coming into the industry. There's been very, there's been no new capital that's come into the industry for, I would argue, six to nine months. And, and you're seeing it in the way these companies are trading. They're trying to come to market. Um, they need growth capital. A lot of these companies are in CapEx and OpEx heavy uh, businesses in, within the industry, which is inherently a kind of a high capex growth industry. Any industry that's a growth industry is capital intensive. I mean, look at Netflix. Yeah, of course, They're still yes. not making money, you know? So, um, and it's Netflix. Yeah. So uh, this has put a crimp on the entire investment landscape. And it's, so it's back to the regulatory framework you're asking me about. These are the things that need to be adjusted. And there was some recent regulation that went through uh, the House on what's called the SAFE Act, which will uh, give investors, will give companies the opportunity possibly to at least bank normally. So to have credit lines, to actually be able to do traditional payroll, to actually keep bank accounts. This is more so that people aren't walking around with suitcases of cash, cash yeah. and that you know people who are Interesting. So Wells and risk. the Bank of America can op have cannabis sure. companies. They, they, they can they, bank. They, they will be able to if this goes Post from safe phase, act. phase one um, was getting through the House. Cool. And, and now this bill is, is going to be read in the Senate at some point, I think in the fall. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, so th this uh, maybe in a macro way, this can be thought of as going from the old codes uh, as emerging markets erupt is to as quickly and also intelligently as possible uh, adjust to the new codes that enable the emerging market to actually rise yeah. and succeed. Um, and I also liked, yeah, all the way from basic accounting um, stuff like SAFE Act to um, all the way up to uh, yeah, geopolitical, uh, like how do you take this big pool of venture money that's really wanting to get involved and enable it uh, to get involved? So is this usually like the thing that happens? Is that, it's just like a period We've of seen time? Some, of, some of these uh, phases I would characterize as very similar. So if we're going to take our same, you know, kind of metaphor and comparison to emerging markets, we, I think we have seen some of this before. Um, you know, an example for, for me was uh, when I was living in Russia, the, the state gas company, Gazprom, is the biggest gas company in the world. And, and at a time when investing in natural resources was a very big investment trend in the early 2000s, through really through the financial crisis, there was this sense that you know, the world was growing, China was consuming more, all these you know, Asian countries and South American countries and younger populations, Middle Eastern countries were consuming, needed more commodities. So anyway, people started investing in commodities. Back to Russia and Gazprom. Gazprom was one of the most interesting investments for a lot of global investors, but as a non-resident investor, a non-resident of Russia, investing in a Russian company required a, 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 a shell and a structure and a creative solution, which is what's going on here too. So, you know, my investors sitting in New York or sitting in Boston and some of the big mutual funds or some of the big hedge funds that are sitting out here in San Fran or LA, you know, they're like, Tim, I want to on gas prime. How do I do it? We had to create a legal structure that allowed them a participation in a, we set up a Russian company because I actually worked for a Russian bank. Now, we don't need to get into the weeds of this, but the point is that um, ultimately there was a lot of capital that could never invest in Russia because a lot of the state-owned companies you couldn't invest in. There was a, it was a federal dynamic in Russia. Um, there was a time in Russia, think about um, the- So frictionless the, is something that we yeah, could maybe say- the Efficient. More, yeah, the more efficient. Yeah, and, yeah. and think about, think about uh, if you're a cannabis investor and you've been watching this industry for a while and you've been watching how Canada certainly had a, a head start and um, 
in terms of the capital markets, arguably, I think probably this area would argue we were, we were the ones that started this industry in a real way in this country and in, in North America. But, but um, I remember where I was the day I heard Constellation Brands was taking a, a majority ownership stake or had the optionality to do that in canopy growth. I remember where I was. I was remembered looking at the markets. I was, it was staggering and shocking. I said, okay, here we go. Yeah. We're going to see every major consumer products company come in because why wouldn't they? Yeah. Um, and in, in Constellation's perspective, I don't think this is about THC infused beverages and, and an alternative to their beer market. And I don't think you uh, think it's more about diversification of portfolio. I think it, I think it is. I think it's I think I think Constellation is a global consumer products company that that is a very sophisticated brand and distribution play. So, Damn. so back to so then, then there's the reliability, the accountability. Yeah, like you're, totally. Yeah, totally. You're diversifying the portfolio, but are is there also that ethical or moral or spiritual alignment with ascension as well, not just the buck making? Well, I mean, you know, I, I feel like we're in my Sunday school class right now, I mean, I you know, I, t I, I, I teach fourth grade Sunday school, by the way. So, <laughs> yeah, I talk about the ascension, um, yeah. and, but 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 to, to but the point I'm making is. A company like Constellation raises the bar for the entire industry, um, but it also, at that time, it drove valuations way higher because everybody said, who's the next one to come in? And of yeah, course, yeah. you know, Molson Coors did a JV with Hexo, and Anheuser uh, Bud did a JV with Tilray. And, and so every, all, some of the biggest, most sophisticated consumer products companies in the world, a lot of them happening to be associated to the spirits industry. Um, but I'm just, you know, wow. back to my metaphors. I remember when, when Telenor, which is Norway's largest phone company, um, decided to buy up GSM, uh, basically sell mobile licenses um, in Eastern Europe. And they started buying them in Russia and they started buying them in Turkey. And, and basically it was again, a global multinational saying, we wanna be exposed to this consumer growth in this part of the world where we aren't yet. And we're gonna take a, 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 a risky leap of faith that we're gonna be able to survive in the regulatory environment and that our shareholders are not gonna um, you know, be very concerned that we're changing our business model. They said, we wanna be a part of this growth. The minute those big multinationals or when, when GM started investing in, in, in auto plants in Russia, or when, when, when Lennar and some of the big home builders started investing in Brazil and, and investing in essentially building homes for the new middle class coming up in the rest of the world. Yeah, I mean, this, yeah. is, this is the exciting part about our industry right now, which is where, you know, you, this is, I think our conversation to tie a thread around where we've been talking for the last few minutes is we've seen this before at other times uh, in investment history. And we've seen it in, in other places where you had a consumption trend that was very exciting and big sophisticated players came into a small pool. Wow. And right now it's still kind of a small pool, not only because of the size of the investments in the companies, but it's made smaller because the regulatory environment is very restrictive yes. and it keeps people out. And it's kept out a lot of these big players, but they're, they're coming, they're gonna be here. Whoa, okay, so could it then be uh, safe to say that with emerging markets progressing, that the, the, the smaller emerging market slowly thinks the regulatory um, frameworks opening up, it becomes, uh, there's more funding that comes in and the funding can come in from some of the bigger players driving up valuations. So this is kind of a reoccurring theme that comes up and then more and more jobs open up, the economy continues sure. to grow, um, the pe people get more work from it, people get like in for the benefits of, uh, of a cannabis, it could be for um, textile purposes, for medicinal purposes, all of the benefits of that wellness side. And so then, di so then the, uh, this is so, with, with the big players coming in, driving up evaluations and also, it's kind of interesting thinking about like the little combinatorics of like, Canada or Israel mm -hmm. or the United States or like other um, even more uh, constrictionist uh, markets like a, like a Chinese market mm -hmm. um, that what would it look like uh, for 1.4 billion people to gain access to right. cannabis as a wellness no, it's, if it's, it happens. Well, it, you know, we talked about this on our panel today. One of the investors talked about how the, the Chinese hemp markets are really kind of the the exciting new frontier out there in terms of the sheer scale and the ability of you know the growing conditions the labor force i mean they they will be producing uh probably a majority of the world's hemp um whether really? whether it will be exported back here I mean, you know and china's been doing this in other agricultural markets as well even though 
uh, it, you know, this may be an evergreen moment in time, this interview, although, but I mean, if we snap to the trade war that's going on right now, you know, it's about is, are the Chinese buying enough of our soybeans? I don't think the Chinese are going to be buying our hemp. I think the Chinese are going to be um, growing their own hemp, and that's, you know, that is part of the excitement of this being a global market. And interestingly enough, potentially used for uh, the purposes of us, like as an economic commodity and not an necessarily industrial commodity. as an industrial commodity and not necessarily as a uh, consumption as an additional yes. consumption. Yes. Wow. So could be banned in that sense as a consumption and could be used. Hard to know. Hard to know. And that would be also crazy to see if a country would do something regulatorily like that, where it would just be for an industrial commodity and not for. A think about um, some of the Far Eastern medicines, though. I mean, think about what people in this country have adopted in terms of non pharmaceutical uh, wellness products that are have originated from China. I mean, we're talking about you know, things like ginkgo, and, and but, but if you go into a lot of the wellness stores, um, Holistic medicine, uh, Eastern medicines are, I mean, I would think this would be kind of a symbiotic uh, dynamic in China. I realize China is going to be uh, highly regulating any consumer product and consumer, uh, you know, access points. But I, I actually think that hemp products for consumption and for wellness and, you know, cannabinoid, you know, research and, and, and development for these products, even in non-THC, uh, I think is, is it, it, to me, it makes sense with based upon where China has come from on these non-pharmacological medicines. So, okay, let's do, uh, yeah, we just came back from partnership interviews in China mm -hmm. and we loved our experience there. And it would be so cool to see how maybe a more uh, a collaborative and harmonious relationship with, a, uh, with something like cannabis could happen around the different countries and the frameworks around the world. So this question is then about, oh, there's a couple more, couple more questions. Um, this one is on uh, moving into like, uh, a, let's say like a decade down the line, regulatory frameworks have opened up, the old codes are, uh, are, are archived and the new codes are implemented. Uh, now, uh, maybe it's even d a, a very serious opening up of, of, um, of the, 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 the micro investment side for, uh, for the, the young uh, uh, short change dogs to come in for a hundred thousand, hundred or a thousand dollar investments into, into these organizations. Does it seem like then uh, that that is in like the job market and the way that people could, even though AI comes in and does things like take away uh, some of the work around maybe retail or automotive or manufacturing and these other industries, call centers and stuff, but does it open up jobs in cannabis? What do those look like? What do you, what do you think? Well, I, I think if, if this develops the way people want it to develop, the unfortunate part of that is it's, it's going, there's going to be, you know, technology is also going to drive a lot of disruption. Yeah. So it's no different than a lot of consumer products. And, and it's going to make the supply chain more efficient. It's going to make the, the, the marketing and the distribution and the, the consumer, uh, you know, understand the consumer tastes and preferences and, and, and obviously building data pools that are based upon consumption trends. And, and that's just to understand who's going to sell what to who. But in terms of production, in terms of distribution, um, and in terms of, you know, all the logistics and ERP, I mean, so it, you know, the, the good and the bad news here is we want <laughs> We, we, we want those cannabis jobs at some point, if we want this to evolve, to get disrupted. It has to happen. And so what makes the cannabis industry so interesting right now is, as a consumer product, it's, it's popping up on the shelves uh, or through Amazon, going down the same road and sitting, not necessarily right next to on the shelves, as, you know, Oreo cookies and, and you know, Wheaties. But, but, I mean, consumer products um, are being distributed to consumers in very sophisticated ways through very sophisticated means based upon very sophisticated consumer marketing research based upon data. So yeah. why is cannabis going to be any different? In fact, that's why it's moving at warp speed. Because while those te technological developments and, and pinpoint focused on certain industries and disruption are changing other industries, Cannabis is being born and those things are changing cannabis at the same time. Yeah. So it's moving twice as fast. And that's, that's good news, but it's probably scary and it's hard to, you can't wow. think that cannabis is going to be able to kind of keep this holistic, um, oh. you know, kind of organic, localized uh, community that's not disrupted by big business. So, wow. 
all, we've not seen emerging markets rise with artificial intelligence until now. And, uh, and right. so now it'll be cool to see what those two rising simultaneously look like. Also um, on especially like, this is, I'm really interested in your perspective here. If then, uh, as emerging markets have historically risen, uh, big dogs come in, swoop majority of initial investments and profits from that, yep. and later uh, makes it easier for smaller dogs to come in and get a, maybe breadcrumbs, let's say. Right. Um, would you then say that the future, it'll be really important to do things like open up the investment for the small people around the world to do these micro investments, 10 bucks, 100 bucks, 1,000 bucks in, uh, to try and uh, spread the, the, the fruits? Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, I think uh, if you think about, um, you know, different types of uh, uh, lending platforms and, you know, VC kind of, you know, for the masses raised platforms, we've seen a bunch of them. Um, in, in pretty traditional investment in, in, in VC private equity worlds. I think expecting that to happen in cannabis is, is, is appropriate and it will. Um, I think one of the reasons why we like the SEC and one of the reasons why there is regulation for all investors of all asset classes is because uh, you know, with, with more immature industries, with highly speculative uh, stuff where there is a lot of hysteria and there is a lot of public interest and there's not a lot of information, um, this is actually, these are the times we want our government to protect us. I know a lot of us would rather have less government, I'm probably one of them, but um, I think to expect uh, cannabis investing for the masses, for the small dogs to, to take the place of the same way they can get involved in, in you know, some kind of a, a technological process or be investing in sure. Tesla or you know, whatever yeah. it is, yeah. and, and, and things that seem to be leading edge and yeah, exciting, yeah. socially conscious, that's all great. Um, and I think that will happen in cannabis. I just think we, the industry and the capital markets and the, the, the investment uh, infrastructure needs to get more sophisticated before you can let these nickels and dimes and small dogs in. And I think you're doing so it, cool. it's, it's, in their, it's in their best interest, I think. Yeah, yeah. And it's just difficult to figure out how an SEC would possibly be able to make it so that $10 investments can go in or $100 investments. And so actually private companies have went and taken on the initiative to buy in 50 million bucks into right. one of the big space sexes and then redistribute out right. fifty dollar bids into that pool. I think that stuff's so awesome democratizing um, financial investment. I think is such an important part of financial literacy, um, eradicating yeah. poverty, uh, yeah, and uplifting people around the world. Um, the stuff. Yeah, yeah. The two last uh, questions that yep. we ask all of our guests on the show. Kay. First one is do you think we're in a simulation? You and I. Yeah. Are we in a simulation? No, we're having a conversation, my friend. We're just, uh, um, you know, but you tell me, are we in a simulation? This is a very interesting question that we like polling. What well, are how are we think. defining a simulation? This is another great question. How do you define it? Yeah, because um, let's think about technology. Okay. Technology itself getting towards super intelligence is able to create simulations of civilizations mm -hmm. of again just big bangs and universes mm -hmm. and watch their evolution mm -hmm. and how is that not already what this potentially is well we are um i think what's wonderful about this industry is there are some elements as we get into both science and and um how people are processing information and the impact of cannabis and cannabinoids and some of the sciences, we don't really know what's going on. One of the powerful and exciting parts of, as a sub-vertical of everything we're talking about is that from a science and research perspective, the power of the plant and the power of the usages um, are, you know, so being able to actually get into literal simulations of, of truly where we can go with, yes. with the technology is part of uh, you know, why I think a lot of us are here. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think there's, there's a literal translation to this, there's a figurative translation to this for an industry that we're kind of trying to figure out where we're going and, and the implications, it's changing society on some level. Let's, um, let's, and it's uh, gonna change medicine. Let's also tie that into what we were just mentioning. How could, there's a SEC, there's code, there's the accounting code, there's right. the SAFE Act code. Right. What if you deployed that code update in a simulation of the United States economy and watched its evolution for five years before you actually did it in the physical world? 
So you, that's the kind of stuff potentially that well, you could leverage with the, the technologies. I, I think we should, we shall, we will, we probably yeah. are. But, but in the same way, in my first job out of business school, I went through a training program at UBS and they gave us market simulators and they gave us mm. different inputs um, yeah. and, and to see you know, how we were gonna manage and assess you know, assets during um, you know, this, this macroeconomic number hits the tape, um, what are markets gonna do? And so, I mean, I, I think we can do that, um, but it's in a vacuum. I mean, I, mm. I, and I realize mm -hmm. simulations have become a lot more sophisticated, so yeah. um, even the market simulations that one might do at a training program at UBS coming out of school today is different than what's probably seeming pretty archaic to the one I was taking at the time that seemed very innovative and edgy. But um, and decades from now, what but, but, to, but yeah, there's no question, whatever we can simulate today is, is going to give us information on tomorrow. Yeah. Um, accepting it as gospel, I think, is, is, would be scary. And the last question we like asking is, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? The most beautiful thing in my family. I mean, I, you know, the, the relationships that people have with each other. Um, I think growing into, uh, uh, you know, coexistence in the human, I mean, people at different times in their life cycle are uh, more or less comfortable in their own skin. And watching people um, and having people get comfortable in their skin together and growing together, but that that, that comes that to me happens in a family environment, right? So I'm a father. I've got kids. Uh, my kids are, you know, six and eleven. Um, and to me, that's the most beautiful thing in the world because, unfortunately, uh, some of the some of the, the the oxidants of the world haven't hit these kids yet. Mm -hmm. And and you know, you you try to you try to keep that as pure as possible. But I I, I really do think. To me, the things that make me happiest are human interactions. So, yeah. yes, my family, yes, you know, yes. people, friends, whatever, communities. And so that, that, that to me is where beauty is derived. I love that the relationships and then also that the comfortability in the skin evolving uh, over time in, yep. in our own passion. And people growth. change. Yeah. People evolve. I mean, they evolve as people. They evolve in their comfort levels in society. And hopefully for the better. I mean, I think, yeah. you know. As a 20-year-old, I was likewise very different. Very different, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was really yeah. cool, but I was really different. I'm just yeah, kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought a it lot, was. Uh, a lot more time to have soaked in the reality that yeah. we're in and become wiser and more yep. knowledgeable. And yeah, Tim, yeah. this has been such yeah. a pleasure. pleasure. Thank you for Great coming on the show. Yeah, thanks. Greatly appreciate. Thanks right. everyone for tuning in. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Check out the links below to Tim's work. Check out the links below to New West Summit. Support the organizations, the artists, the entrepreneurs, the leaders around the world that you believe in. You can support simulation. Our links are below as well. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you soon.